each day, more and more people are listening to music on Spotify. And that's also true for podcasts. Next time you're on the Spotify app, make sure to follow Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Enjoy listening to Lou, his incredible guests, and all of the amazing episodes. Listen, follow, and share. Thrive Loud on Spotify. So here's how it works. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed, and you believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you listen to Thrive Loud, and Lou shows you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Get ready to Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Thrive Loud with Lou Diamond connecting you to the most inspiring and amazing people that are thriving each and every day. I'm your host, Lou Diamond. Today on Thrive Loud, we have a relationship artist and coach that helps purpose-driven, successful women in expanding joy and fulfillment beyond their work. She helps women deepen love and connection in their relationship with themselves and others. She brings a unique and unparalleled perspective to what it means to be your full, authentic self in a relationship, instead of trying to mold yourself to others' opinions so you can't so you can fit in. Thrive Loud listeners, I bring you Marie, Elizabeth, Molly. Marie, Elizabeth, how are you? I'm doing great today. Thank you. How are you? I am so excited to have you here today. You are coming to us from Los Angeles and uh, enjoying hopefully a a, a nice summer day. It, it's, it's a little ridiculously hot over here in the Northeast. Mm, I've heard, I've heard. So you've got an interesting title. And I actually want to jump right into this because you call yourself a relationship artist. I want to hear a little bit about this because I actually think this is probably the best description for the work that you do. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I, I came up with that title because relationship coach just doesn't cover it. Um, I have a background as a creative. I'm also a writer. And I just believe that relationship and relating to others, there's an art to it. It's an artful process to learn how to do relationship with skill. And so I wanted to highlight the artistry part of it because just thinking relationship coach, my mind tends to go, oh, well, there's a problem and I have to fix that. And that's fine. It's great to fix a problem. But there's so much more available to us in relationship if we approach it as a ground where we can become as skilled and as artistic as we are with our actual craft or our actual work that we do. Marie Elizabeth, who are the people that come to you? Uh, uh, Who are the people that come to me? Well, it's funny because my bio says women, and I do work with men privately, and I work with women privately and with groups. And the women who come to me and the men tend to be very creative, very accomplished in certain parts of their life, especially their careers, but their relationships don't flow as easily or unfold as smoothly and um, skillfully as their work does. So I love to work with people who already have access to their brilliance in a certain domain and All we have to do is really transfer that excellence, transfer that strength into the domain of relationship because they just haven't learned how to do that there. Marie Elizabeth, do you think that there is some underlying reason or commonality, if you would, with the people that you work with on what maybe when why they have trouble with their their individual and personal relationships? Yeah, I think it's a combination of being raised in a culture that values production. So um, all the praise and attention and focus was around what they make or what they do. And our culture just doesn't value connection as much on the whole. So there isn't as much uh, opportunity to learn how to do connection well. That's the first reason. The second reason is we're raised by imperfect people and we're raised even in our educational system. I mean, all the people we come into contact with when we're little, they've all got their own stuff. You know, we're all trying to work our own stuff out. So there aren't a lot of models to look to for successful relationship, for skillful relationship. And when you don't have models, it's hard to create it yourself. 
I know there's no perfect relationship. Really, it's the relationship you have and how, and that's its perfection at its best, ups and downs and all the rounds that happen within it. I, I guess is part of the work that you do to get people to recognize that, you know, there is no perfect answer. There is no home run record setting year in relationships. <laughs> it, it's obviously a component of just, you know, what is really, I'm trying to understand a little bit about how you help change that mindset. Cause that is difficult with top performers of the clients that you seem to be working with who are, have such an expectation for success in their regular line of work. Well, one of the ways um, that I help bridge the disconnect is by focusing on connection. The more that you feel nourished, the more you feel fulfilled in your love and connection at home, it actually enhances your ability to hit flow at work. So it's not, I, I think what happens with top performers is they kind of compartmentalize and it's like, I'm going to throw my all into my work so I can be the best at this. And relationship is kind of an afterthought. And then it suffers because it's the afterthought. Whereas if relationship, if the cultivation of your ability to show up present, available, uh, self-regulated you know you have the ability to handle yourself when you get upset and communicate under duress all those skills that you cultivate in relationship serve you in your work they make you more successful at work uh and so to me it's a part of it is really learning to bridge this this compartmentalization or this gap that we've created between in a culture that values co production over connection i want to talk about the relationships i guess with two specific people uh, is that work obviously that you do as well. So it's two people that are having trouble in a personal relationship and you can help work with the pair. Yes. I mean, okay. I do actually sometimes do couples work with the actual pair. Uh, more often I work with an individual because what I find is that as you clean up your own baggage around how you relate to others, some of your reactivity, your historical experiences, your trauma that you might, you know, we all come out of childhood traumatized in one way or another, yeah. uh, and some more than others, right? And so as that begins to heal and resolve, and you begin to show up with more uh, presence and awareness and mindfulness and skill, uh, the relationship shifts. I don't have to work with both people for the relationship to shift. I find that as one person comes into their own, so to speak, that, you know, really embodies themselves and becomes more able to show up in an authentic way with self-trust, with trust that they can speak their desire and be heard and they can listen to the desires of another person and accommodate and work with that, you know? The more you learn to show up in yourself and for yourself, the relationships all shift. It's funny, Marie Elizabeth, we, we just had a recent guest this summer, uh, Mia Hewitt, who talked about trauma, uh, mm. that we all have this trauma pretty much before the age of seven in our in our childhood that obviously affects who we are and most of her work in helping business leaders is trying to decode and go through that traumatic experience from when you were way back and when you were little to, to a lot of the points you've been making. And yes. uh, it, it's 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 deep work and it's and I think it's hard because so many people are, have there's so many layers to peel back. I want to tap this conversation a little bit into your direction. Mm. Uh how have your personal relationships been throughout your life that you're able to kind of provide this new way of thinking? Because obviously someone as creative as you has one side of it. I'm, I'm curious to know how, how this kind of became your, your gig. <laughs> well, we teach what we most need to learn, right? Right. <laughs> so so um, it became my gig because I wasn't doing that well at it. And uh, I've always loved my work. I mean, I've, I've been involved in, uh, I started as a massage therapist after college, then I got a master's in Chinese medicine. I was in patient care for 13 years, then I burned out and went back to school um, to become a poet. I actually got an MFA in poetry. Wow. And then after 10 years of exclusively being a writer, uh, I kind of missed people. And so <laughs> um, I, I began to want to work with people again. And so in that time, I also got married and my marriage, so relationships had always taken a backseat to my work. 
I, I'm kind of the creative person that I tend to work with in that way. And what I found as I got divorced, we, our, our marriage was mostly great, but there was this depth of connection that I was hungry for that we couldn't reach on a regular basis. We just weren't well matched in that way. And so it took a lot for me. I really believed in forever, you know, until death do us part and all of that. But as my health got worse and worse and worse and worse, and I began, uh, you know, I had all these health problems and couldn't have the energy to do my work, I began to realize that my body was trying to tell me that I really wasn't happy. Yeah. It wasn't that I was incapable of having a great relationship. It was that I was unhappy in this relationship. And so we parted amicably in 2012. And I threw myself into the study of relationships to learn really what makes me tick, what makes other people tick, why are, why are they so hard? You know, they always felt kind of like sandpaper to me as an introvert. I was like, if I could just be a monastic, I, that would be great. But I also know I'm not wired to be a monastic. And so I studied the art of relating deeply took a second coaching program. I had already been trained as a coach. I took a second pro program directly related to relationship dynamics, communication, sexuality, all, all the things that go into making connections rich and deep and true. And through that process, and actually um, while I was in that community, I met the love of my life and we've been together about five years and we have this relationship that I never dreamed I could have. I mean, it's really founded in each of our growth where, where, the, where the focus of the relationship is on how do we support each other to grow more than it is on comfort, hmm. say. I, I like that. Thank you, by the way, for sharing all that. And it's, uh, it really is interesting. I, you started mentioning something in there that, that just ran through my head and, and as a coach, there's there's this general belief um, you're not supposed to solve. You have to let those that you're coaching kind of solve the problems for them. You're providing the mm -hmm. tools, and they they need to come up with the answers as a because then it becomes a telling exercise, and it doesn't have the yeah right. Um, but yet we also know that sometimes the answer is so clear as day that every now and then you need to have the moment of like the whacking the person aside the head. <laughs> <laughs> the knocks, you, you're missing the complete obvious of this. And I want to ask this question because this is, this is general for, for, for whether it's personal relationships, it's actually a real leadership message that I have. And that is that those moments do happen. You would agree, obviously by your. your Absolutely. Laughter. Yeah. Um, have, the tact on having to deliver that type of message. Can you talk about that? Because I actually think it's really important because I do have this conversation. One of the things that I've always found frustrating and many times about coaching is that by hovering around so much every now and then you need to literally stick the dart in or hit mm. and slap the side of the head. But the way that you deliver can be so effective. Uh, I'm curious to hear ways that you've found to try to help somebody find and solve the answer and ways that kind of helps expedite them and puts them on the track. Can you share that with the listeners a little bit of maybe even the ways that you do that? Yeah, I love this question. Thank you. I love the nuance and the depth in, in it. Thank you. So one, one of the primary ways that I do that is through sharing personal story. Mm -hmm. I, I find that, um, Oftentimes, and it really depends on the client. With some clients, I'll say, hey, I have something potentially confronting to say. Would you like to hear it? Right? So I'll, I'll ask for permission yeah. to throw the dart, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. um, that's one way. But often, I'll say, hey, I've got a story for you. And I'll tell them a story that illustrates the thing I want them to get. And then at the end of the story, I'll say, how does that land with you? Or how do you think that relates to what we're talking about? And, I'm, and I then wait for them to make the connection. So it's still a form of them coming up with their own answer, but I've pointed them toward the answer I want them to get, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes. But then they get to own the idea because they're the one that made the connection. And I find that really sharing personal story, it humanizes me because a lot of what I work with with my clients is their self perception yeah. and their level of self acceptance 
and really having permission for all of themselves to exist, even the parts that they wish did not. That's a lot of the work I do because I like it. that creates spaciousness in a relationship for the other person to be who they are, right? And if yes. you let yourself be you. So a lot of how I do that is by telling stories that, you know, show how imperfect I am. And then that in that way, that gives them permission to access their own brilliance, even amid a moment where they might be feeling shame. Maria Elizabeth, I love asking guests this question. And I love also asking coaches this question because it puts them on the other side of the microphone, for lack of a better term here. And mm -hmm. that is, we all have days when we're rocking it and doing great and everything's in the flow. And then we have those off days when we're not quite kicking on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. Maria Elizabeth, when you have trouble thriving, what practice do you seek or what individual do you seek out to get yourself back on the thriving track? Mm, great question. So uh, it depends on how off I feel. So if I just feel a little bit off, I will go to a gratitude practice and remind myself what feels good in my life and what I'm grateful for. I will go to a practice of naming um, three things I like about myself or three, I, three, three wins that I had in the past day. So I'll remind myself that the, what my mind is focusing on is not the only thing here. That's when it's, I'll go, yeah. So that's when it's kind of just a little bit off, but not terrible. Right. Um, if I'm really, really, really off, like there is zero joy accessible to me, which happens sometimes. For example, I recently broke my arm and was put on tramadol, which is an opiate. And as I, this somehow happens, I don't know if this happens for everybody, but for me, as I'm transitioning off of tramadol onto Tylenol, uh, it's like all the joy leaves my life and I'm weeping every five minutes and mm. it lasts a few days. Wow. So I had a few days last week like that. Luckily I'm out of it. <laughs> Otherwise I would not have done this interview today. Uh, but you know, I, I, I deliberately remind myself, this is what it's like when I'm coming off this painkiller, right? So I remind myself not to take my thoughts seriously, not to believe that what they're saying about me or my life is true. There's another aspect of this that happens a lot with uh, health, like with our bodies. When things are off in our bodies, it can throw off our thinking. So another thing I do is I notice if my thinking starts going in a particularly, it has a particular flavor of self-hatred or self-criticism, that's my cue to get my hormone levels checked for my thyroid, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. So, so I've learned over the years to, I, I, I have a 25 year meditation practice, right? So I have a deep uh, habit of observing my thoughts and not believing them just that they're me right yeah. and so that's what i do you know and the last part is i let myself be down it's one thing if i need to it, it, i'm so practiced at this point at client work that the moment i stand at my desk and get ready to be with a client i'm on and then I get off the call with the client and I might be weeping again five minutes later. So there's, a, there's, a, there's something in my system that is just habituated to being able to show up for a session, even if I'm completely messed up the other, all the other hours of the day. <laughs> so so I, I can rely on that. Yeah. And then on the other hours of the day, I let myself be down. I don't force it. And I don't make it worse by making it mean more than what it is. It shows the the discipline you've had in, in meditation, obviously, the whole point of just being, uh, whether it's to, don't take yourself too seriously is probably one of the better answers I've ever heard on, <laughs> on how I'd be able to treat myself and make myself get back on the thriving track, but also let it run its course, which is a real interesting part because sometimes we just need to let the body do that. That's really sharp. I like that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I really think it has to do with permission. Um, and I, and I, and this is hard one. Like I spent many years on the gotta be on and productive all the time track, you know, and I spent many years doing violence to myself in the down in yep. that way of trying to force myself out of it. 
And what I've learned is this gentler approach of let me remember some things I'm grateful for. Let me remember that I'm not all bad. Let me remember that, you know, there's good in my life. And, and let me just let it be because what goes up must come down. What goes down must come up. It'll happen. I, I've learned to just trust my cycle in that way. Maria Elizabeth, let's do the admin part of the show here. If you could share with the listeners yeah. all the places people can find you. And uh, we will put it all in the show notes. However, it always gets more engagement when they hear it directly from you. Website, socials, you name it. Great. So my website is memali.com, which is spelled M-E-M-A-L-I.com. On Facebook, you can find me at M-E-Mali Coach. On Instagram, it's M-E-Mali 108. That's the same for Twitter and LinkedIn as well. Yeah. And... Uh, I have a quiz um, that's really fun. If anyone's interested, it's called "What's Your Relationship Style?" Through my through my work and thirty years of personal growth study and work, I've identified four stages of consciousness we tend to be in around how we relate to ourselves and others. And this quiz uh, helps you understand which stage you're at at um, at this point and what to focus on and work on to evolve and expand into the next stage. And as I say that, I call it a continuum. Rather, it's, I, I don't find growth and development to be a very linear process. I think we're operating on many cylinders at the same time. For example, someone can be hugely accomplished in their work and crappy in relationship, right? So, you know, clearly that they're at a different stage of development with respect to their work than they are with intimate relationships. So, um, this quiz helps you discern where you're at, what to work on, and helps you understand um, what, you know, something bad happens in your life. You may revert to old behaviors and that's okay. You've just shifted states of consciousness in response to a traumatic event. And then you know what to focus on to bring yourself back to where you want to be. So that quiz is located at M-E Mali quiz. So that's M-E-M-A-L-I.com slash quiz. Got it. We will put the quiz link right in there. A quiz link. It's like a quiz link. Yeah, quiz, quiz link. link. I like it. All right. Uh, permission to go down Fun Street with you, Marie Elizabeth. I'm all about Fun Street. Let's go. I know. Okay. So can you share with the listeners right out of the gate what your all-time favorite movie is? The Matrix. And why does The Matrix connect so much with you? Because, well, I first saw it in 1999 when it came out, and I've watched it a ton of times since then. And to me, it's, uh, it's a deeply spiritual movie in the guise of sci-fi, which I always, I love it when spiritual principles get stealthily inserted into the culture. That just gives me a kind of surreptitious glee. So there's that piece of really questioning what is real? What, what do I believe? What is real? What, who am I? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, do I have choice or is it all fate? All these big questions in that movie just give me so much joy you know and the um morpheus also has a line i'm going to paraphrase it something along the lines of um it's not about it's not enough to know the path you have to walk the path he didn't right. say it quite like that but something like that and and i i really live by that like you can know a lot of things but unless you're day to day doing the practices and um actually embodying the knowledge in your life mm -hmm, talk is cheap, you know? Yeah. So I just find uh, there's such a richness and also especially the conversation with the Oracle. Oh yeah. Where, uh, which is so amazing because she tells him what he, you know, he didn't believe he was the one. So she, so she corroborated his belief. This is exactly what the world does. Whatever you believe about yourself, that's what the world is going to reflect back to you. And it wasn't until he had that moment of stopping the bullets where he really got it. Like, oh shit, I'm, I'm the one. But he had to get to that knowledge through experience. It couldn't come from someone else. He was looking to her for permission right. and approval and, and trying to have that change his belief. And that's just not how it works. And so I find, I, I just think that's so deep and amazing that they, that they talked about that in that way in that movie. There's such an underlying uh, other meanings that they have put into this. I've read enough of stupid websites about this stuff okay. where they've done it. You know, like even the, the, the names of the characters have purpose um, with Trinity representing yes. old traditions and Morpheus being the change of the shape and Neo being new. 
New, um, yes. With all that. But Neo, of course, as we all know, is also in a, what's the word when you split the, split the letters around for the one. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of plays on that. If you ever really want to go deep, we can do that on another podcast. Really at this point, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> I would, I would love to dive deep because um, we're, we're about to binge watch all three again. Um, Cause I remember being so impressed uh, when uh, at the end of the third one, which I haven't seen in years, um, they screened. I, I just remember seeing a Sanskrit shloka there and my mind was blown because that was yeah. it, it's the one um asatoma sakamaya it's like it's it's lead me from untruth to truth darkness to light and death to eternal life or something like that i i don't i might be getting the meaning you know not translating it exactly right but i i just when i saw that I, it, it made me go back and watch all the movies again through yeah. that lens. It's, you know? it's, it's, it's a great picture. Okay, so here's yeah. what we're going to do now. We're going to do something kind of like the speed round here. And uh, I'm going to say a certain, ask you a certain question. And then the first thing that comes to mind, that makes you feel good. That's really what this whole part's about because our listeners love to understand what people like. So Yay. Right, roll here. Here we go. A song that picks you up or you love to listen to. Golden by Jill Scott. Favorite food that's not a dessert. Oh, <laughs> uh, plantains. A favorite food that is a dessert. Dark chocolate, 70% or higher. <laughs> Activity you wish you did more of. Well, right now it's working out because of this arm. <laughs> <laughs> An activity you wish you did less of. Uh, probably TV. If you could snap your fingers and go anywhere, where are you? <gasps> I'm in Socorro. Uh, I'm, I'm at the Revilla Jijeros Islands in Mexico, scuba diving with the mantas and the sharks. Okay, that is the most specific and quickest answer ever. I love that, by the way. I'm an underwater photographer also, and so I just really, I'm dying not being in the water. I haven't been, I went to the Galapagos in May of last year, and I, I this year has just tanked all the diving I was supposed to do, so tanked it's on my mind. Yes. Oh, yeah, right. Pun not intended, but Perfect. <laughs> Thought leader, relationship artist, coach, scuba diver. We just learned the whole bit. Uh, and, and obviously, future TEDx speaker, as we'll probably put some promo links down the road. Um, there's a message that you'll soon be delivering. What, what will you be speaking about when you speak about what you speak about? I will be speaking about how relationships are a training ground for your genius. Oh, I like it. Maria Elizabeth, Molly, so glad to have you on the program. Thank you so much for coming on Thrive Loud. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. And to all our listeners out there, thank you for joining us. And until next time, keep thriving onward and upward. And remember, be brief, be bright, be gone. You've been listening to Thrive Loud with your host, Lou Diamond. Check us out on the web at thriveloud.com and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Thrive Loud. And check us out on the Good Pods app at Thrive Loud, where you can follow, listen, and connect directly to Lou and all of the Thrive Loud episodes. Thanks for listening.